Hello, this is the Palo Alto Research Center, seared into the technology industry's consciousness as Xerox Park, although today it's a wholly owned but independent subsidiary of Xerox. And this is where Ethernet was invented, along with a host of other world-changing inventions. But it's about Ethernet that I want to talk today, and I'm going to go inside and talk to the man who started it all. We're standing very close to the spot where Bob Metcalf first drew this diagram and sent the memo that outlined Ethernet for the very first time. So Bob, tell me something about the process. Tell me about who was involved in that. Well, that's one of the more dangerous questions associated with Ethernet innovation because hundreds of people have invented Ethernet over the years. But going back to 1973, Dave Boggs and I were the principal uh, developers and inventors of Ethernet, but we had a lot of help. So uh, listed on the patent were our two um, spiritual leaders, Butler Lamson and Chuck Thacker, who made many contributions. And then Tat Lam, uh, who actually was a contractor here in Xerox. He, he didn't work here. And he helped us develop the transceiver. He was an expert in um, picofarads. Uh, and we had uh, uh, David Liddell. And the list goes on. And I'm sure I'm going to offend several people by stopping there. So tell me something about the network itself. How big was it? And why was it called Ethernet in the first place? So after the first, uh, you know, the first Ethernet was a one-node Ethernet, which isn't very interesting. You know, it's a node that could transmit to itself for testing and debugging purposes. And then we had two nodes, which incidentally we called Michelson and Morley, who happened to be the two physicists who disproved the existence of the ether. So we thought that was ironic. But then eventually the cable got strung all over the building. And in those days, our big innovation, by the way, was putting a computer on every desk. I know that's hard to believe, but we put one on every desk and then ran this coax down the middle of the corridor, and then everybody tapped into it from their PCs in the office. So that grew to fill this building, and then the other labs of Xerox uh, wanted similar things, so we installed them, and then the labs wanted to be connected, so we built, with an internet protocol, we built an internet that spanned uh, the research laboratories of Xerox. And then it wasn't until the late 70s it would began leaving Xerox and uh, installing Ethernets elsewhere. So Ethernet began in one room, spread across park, and within 20 years had more or less taken over the world. So what is it that's so special about this area where it all began? So Bob, what was it in the 1970s that made Silicon Valley such a great place for innovation, ideas, game-changing products and services, all that? Well, it starts with people, people drawn into this uh, epitome of the free enterprise system, uh, a system with great respect for science and education and engineering and entrepreneurship and business, uh, and the weather, by the way. Have I mentioned the weather? And it also helped that by, even by then, in the 70s, uh, Silicon Valley had a tradition of innovation going back decades. And within that tradition, it was expected that you would innovate, and uh, innovation was supported. We had all that going for us in the 70s here in Silicon Valley. So the place was Silicon Valley, the time was the 1970s, and innovation was in the air. It's a great story, but to call it the golden age of innovation misses the key point, because in recent years the global spread of Ethernet has done even more to drive innovation, as Bob explains. We didn't have Google. We didn't have the Internet, really. So now researchers, innovators, can uh, find out in the twinkling of an eye almost all the previous work. They can find all the people working in the field. They can begin collaborating afar. So we have a, a, what I would call collective intelligence that's been created through the, the connectivity of the Internet, and that is, uh, that is uh, accelerating innovation. It's a contributing to the continued acceleration of innovation. Now this is the 40th anniversary of Ethernet and there's a special event happening on the 22nd and 23rd of May 2013 to celebrate that and to look forward to another 40 years hopefully of innovation. You've been heavily involved in organizing that event. Can you tell me something about your part in that? We're having three events really. One is a, a day organized by Park to uh, look at the history of the innovation process that brought Ethernet along. And then we're going to have, uh, and this will be at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. And then we have a, a, an evening event, which I'm calling the Gala, which has a tour of the History Museum and an auction and awards and good food and uh, camaraderie. 
And then the next day we have industry briefings. Because it turns out the industry, now called the Ethernet industry, is a $100 billion a year industry. So we're going to take this occasion to bring uh, journalists from around the world for briefings by the participants in the Ethernet industry. One feature of the event is this special display created by the Computer History Museum outlining the history of Ethernet from a 2.94 megabit per second network running on thick coax cable to today's high-speed Ethernet running over fibre, copper or wireless. But the focus of May's celebration is not so much on history as on innovation. Where is it taking us? How best to nurture the innovators of tomorrow? Now I've been joined by Steve Hoover, who's the CEO of Park. Steve, thanks so much for joining us. Now this is a hotbed of innovation. Tell us something about the atmosphere here. One of the key things actually is recognizing that innovation is going to require failure. So if you can't start something and not believe that it's possible to fail, then you'll never start things that are innovative. Of course, it's not about failing. Failing's not good but it's about learning. Because innovation is starting with an idea which you think might be true, and then proving whether it is or not. So the biggest thing about innovative culture, and that's why all the, the questioning and the why, right, it's, you know, you know, it's like having a bunch of five-year-olds. Why, 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 is because that actually leads to really good innovations. Because people are getting to the fundamental ideas. They're questioning the status quo. They're willing to change it and break it. Fail on the way, and then pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and move on to the next. Now, one of the crucial elements of that is about business and government working well together. Tell yeah. us something about that. Yeah. Government plays a really important role in this because the government actually does identify fundamental research areas to work in and is willing to invest in that. And so that partnership of government investing in core capabilities and new areas, taking some of the higher risk, and then industries really being able to capitalize and leverage that is, is really important. It is, in fact, if you look back uh, at the history of the Ethernet, um, of course, the Internet prior to that, ARPANET, was a government-initiated activity. And the tremendous commercial impact, you know, I don't believe would, would, would have occurred without the foresight of investing in some of those fundamental capabilities. And so today at Park, we are working to repeat that model over and over and over again. The discussion will also look at the other key partnership, the one between business and academia. Among Bob Metcalf's many roles, he's now Director of Innovation at Texas University, giving him a unique insight into what really motivates today's innovators. We're after freedom and prosperity, and innovation is the engine that drives that virtuous circle between freedom and prosperity, and there are many forms of innovation, and the particular kind that I'm focused on that, that came out of uh, places like Xerox, that comes out of places like Xerox Park, is uh, one in which the, the professors do research, research universities, they produce research as a product, they produce students as a product, and then the students are the best vehicles, the embodiment of the innovations as they take those innovations out into the market. And then there's two variations of that. There's the, the taking of those innovations into large existing companies through the open innovation processes there. And, and then there's my favorite kind, which is the creation of uh, innovative startups that uh, bring, once again, take those innovations and package them properly and scale them up into world markets. Innovation is vital. It drives progress and makes the world a better place to be. And Ethernet is one innovation that's connecting people and institutions the world over. In fact, sessions from these events are being shared with tomorrow's young innovators around the world thanks to Carrier Ethernet and the pioneering work of the MEF. It helps create an even more fertile culture of innovation for years to come. And this is what we'll be celebrating at Silicon Valley's Computer History Museum on the 22nd of May. I look forward to meeting you there. Remember, innovation is vital. It drives progress and makes the world a better place to be.